live. All right, theme song. Is that Tyler? How you doing? Me? Yep. Did you yeah, hear the theme song? I just played the theme song, so you're, I'm you're right on time. time. You're on time. It's beautiful. Yep. Uh, I should say uh, welcome to the Funky Friday at Five. This is a series that uh, I do on the podcast, and I do it fairly regularly, Tyler. Um, I would say about once a month, twice a month, sometimes. And you are the guest this month. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here too. I mean, there's so much to, I should say that the occasion of you here is you have a brand new album, if you want to call it that, recording, album, record. I call it an album. Album, yeah. absolutely. We, we'll, we'll get into that because it is very much an album. Um, it's called Lamentations of the Bullfrog. Am I right? The Bullfrog's Lamentations. The Bullfrog's yeah. Lamentations. And there's even a there's a two part cut on the album, part one and part two of, of mm -hmm. his or her lamentation, right? Yep. And um, we could talk about if you don't mind going into the weeds and, and, and getting into some of the lyrics and things, but it's very exciting. I have to say that um, um, I was on one of your earlier albums, right? I believe. Yes, my my first studio album, Long Gone Carrier. Long Gone Carrier. I play a little piano on that. I'm not I on this one. Great piano on that record, Mitch. Well, thank you. I, I like to, I really like doing that project, but this is sort of a band you've solidified in Boston, right? And mm -hmm. uh, I should say that it's my favorite of all your albums thus far. Oh. I think the music is, a, is um, well, we could talk about that. The music is very adventurous and it's, um, you know, there, there are songs on the album that are very accessible and relatable that have an identifiable sort of country feeling or a, uh, Almost a Tom Petty, like the first cut on the album, I feel like it was listening to a Tom Petty song, which I don't know, Jackson Brown. But then it goes off into left field. It goes into a very dissonant, almost avant-garde, Captain Beefheart feeling, like on Disco Duck. And and then there are some songs uh, um, like the bottom, bottom of the bottle and some of the in the uh, that have a have a real poetic quality. And anyhow, I've said too much, but probably. Mm -hmm. You know, you should probably talk about your own album. So, what comes to your mind first? That well, welcome to the show, and and um, what comes to your mind first about your album or music or what's going on in your life? Or uh, well, uh, I'm just happy to be able to talk about this album because it had been in the works for a long time. Uh -huh. This was we were supposed to record it uh, before the pandemic started. Really? But yeah, it was it was a real as you as you know it was just the idea of getting together with musicians was a perilous activity. And there were, you know, people in the band who didn't want to do it. And uh, oh. yeah, the, the band, they actually, three of them all live in a house together okay. 10 minutes away from me. So, you know, we do most of our rehearsals in their basement there. And, uh -huh. you know, it was, it was a, a fraught issue of whether to continue rehearsing. And we had all pretty much the whole record set two years ago, but, couldn't book a studio to do it. You know? 
Well, I have some questions about that now from my limited understanding. Again, I'm no, <laughs> I am no expert on anything medical or health or any of that stuff. I'm <laughs> far from it. But I would think that maybe if people um, kind of got tested or, 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 you know, vaccinated or, or whatever, they could sort of synchronize. I, I, I would think and enter the studio that way, but maybe not. I guess everybody's on a different, different. Yeah. I don't know the mechanics. Well, of it. well my way of, of the way I like to make albums is have everyone in the room together, pretty much, sure. and doing it. So there are people who, you know, recorded albums across the country, right? Because of technology, you're able to do that, like record a part and send it back to someone. But to me, this band, I was just so excited about the live gigs we've been playing, and I right. wanted to. You can't do that if you're, unless you're not all in the same room playing. You know? So I guess that's the issue is that you wanted to have the intimacy and the spiritual connection among the musicians in the band, which is very, of course, very important. And of course, you know, through Jam Kazam and these other methods, <laughs> Jam Kazam and Zoom. Or something there? What was that? Isn't that a Shaquille O'Neal film from the 90s, Shazam? He it plays like a, a genie. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Probably, there's something, but anyway, let's get back on. Topic. Well, there are there are software things where people can play long distance, and and you know sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's not the same as, especially if a band like yours, everybody lives together. Mm. That's like, why not do it, right? So I was just asking an informational question if people could get, you know, maybe feel safer that way. But you know, and kind of. But then there's other factors like getting the studio and recording. Yeah, it, it was just it was just a very strange time because. You know, I'm always writing, I'm always writing songs, but there was just no platform, uh, you know, outside of doing maybe one odd show outdoors or online, like these songs were only being heard by myself and the band and a few close right. friends. So it's really been incredible just to get this album finally out to, for people to listen to after this the last two years. Absolutely. Well, you know, there's a lot of things about the album that really struck me. I mean, of course, the lyrics are really, even for you, and you, you like to write very literary, uh, complex lyrics compared to your average singer-songwriter, even. Thank you, much. You know, um, but putting aside the lyrics, which we get into, uh, the musical arranging is really strong, using different instruments, and I like very much your rhythm section. I like Tim's drumming. I like, the, I like that you have violin, and so... so there's a lot to talk about. So do you, do you want to talk about the lyrics or the poetic content of what of the songs on the album or, or the or or both or the arrangements? Well, you know, I'm I'm very proud of the arrangements on this record because uh it's just you know, I've listened back to it a few times and everything just was was like mixed really well, you know, yeah. you, you can you can hear everything uh, real clear. And uh to me that's that's the biggest joy of of going into the studio is the ability to arrange all these things that if you try to do it live would be very fraught with uh, you know bad sound and yeah. organizing it would be too much. So you know you you get the chance on an album to to get all the things that you kind of dream of for a song. Yeah. I mean yeah it's um I mean you're expanding a little bit on this album with some different instrumentation. Um in, in arranging, now I know that you, we've talked in the past, you're interested in arranging as its own art form. And I know you're, I know you like what Randy Newman does with that. I know we've talked about yeah. it. I just, can you believe I just saw for the first time the Harry Nielsen document? Oh man, it's fantastic. I mean, it's an older documentary. I'm embarrassed really? to say I haven't seen it thus far, but I finally caught up and watched it. You know, who is Harry Nielsen? I, uh, you know, oh, man. Yeah, that's, <laughs> he's an influence on you, right? I mean, I sort of feel like, um, um, wow. He, he is, but, but, uh, Nilsson and I have a key difference among many things is, is oh. that he didn't like to play live, you know, and, and to oh, me, uh, like the live shows are, are some of what I enjoy doing most, you know, interesting. He was, he was the, the consummate studio yeah. LA musician, rock musician of the same. And that's, in that sense, he's kind of like Fagan and, and Becker, right? In yeah. He's in that world there, but those kind guys were, were kind of almost, as far as I know, you know, not living to the degree of excess that Nilsson was at the time. No, yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's well, that's a whole other. Well, yeah, but that, I sort of feel like, um, you know, on our show podcast, we try to create a, a space where all the artists can come together. 
maybe not physically together. So I, you know, I like the idea of having a jazz person on the show mm -hmm. who has nothing to do with at all with songs or vocal, very instrumental. I'm mean, actually, I have a great concert pianist that's coming on the show this, oh, wow. this week, next week, who's played all over the world, you know, classical piano. And then I have a, a rock person like yourself. I like the idea. It's very important to me on, on the show, not to wave a flag or get too, too preachy, is to have all these people come to the same room or be in the same, to share what, what they have in common and, and miss the stylistic differences, right? Or things, you know, and, and I often found that, find it in the arts. Like I have that poster of Melanie Mirror on Girlfriends. That's oh, I have my little, yeah, I have my little Herbie Hancock. I met him. That's um picture. Yeah. I saw uh, uh, Herbie, the Hancock lecture he did back when he came to Harvard uh, a yeah. number of years ago. Remember that? Yeah. And you went to the Laurie Anderson one, didn't you? Because you were lucky to be living there. Did you see? I, I did not get to go to that. I think that was during the pandemic, right? When she was, I don't think she got to give uh, speeches in person. I could be wrong, but I would probably oh, love to see that. Well, Jay Weig told me that he had dinner with her, so she did come to the oh, Jay. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, lucky Jay, right? Lucky Jay, man. Lucky Jay, this had dinner with Laurie Anderson after her Norton lecture. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm I'm 54, so I saw those. I saw that stuff. Oh, Superman! I saw those things as like an 11, 12 year old, 13, 14 year old. Yeah, I, I saw her perform once at Williams College. Oh wow! About 10 years ago, and it it was a very memorable performance. She came out with this. Yeah. You know, the electric violin, of course. Oh, yeah. It was just very high concept kind of stage performance. Well, you know, I'm into that stuff. I love Robert Wilson. I mean, I'm, I just finished watching um, the uh, Netflix series on Warhol, and there's a lot of stuff. Not a lot, but there's a little bit in there on Meredith Monk and mm -hmm. and the kit, you know, that overlap between that world of downtown music because of Basquiat and yeah. the kitchen. And so I, you know... I came into that stuff a little bit later in life, even though I was exposed to it, but I didn't fully understand it. So I, I see I see life as like a big school, Tyler. I'm in school, and so you are. Yeah. I'm in school, and so but, but there's no graduation, and so I feel like I'm now starting to really get into Laurie Anderson in a way, in in a fuller, richer way than I did ten years ago. Just like you know, people change, you know, and you get into different things and. I don't want to talk too much about that, but just like your music, your album has a lot of things in it. I'm really struck. Do you want to talk about particular songs? So, so bottom of the bottle or just, well, I was going to say that, that song, that's one of those tunes I wrote where I felt it was a, it was a, it was a breakthrough for me almost. And just that the kind of duration of something that I was trying to sustain with narrative in that song, because a lot of my songs, they kind of, you know, they flicker in and out with these kind of images that are hard to pin down. But with that song, I felt like I was trying to tell this story, which is essentially Under the Volcano, the book by Malcolm Lowry. And that's pretty much the narrative of that song. OK, stop right there. You and I had a personal conversation about I just saw this movie. Which has one of my. Yeah. Well, that's you talking about the Jacqueline Bissett picture, the. Um, the John Houston picture under the volcano. John Houston picture. Is Jacqueline Bissett and Robert Finney, or am I confused? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, under the volcano. Um, but you had just seen that for the first time, right? So you, I think, take a lot of your inspiration for your songs from actual other art forms, like novels you read. I do. I do. Yeah. Is that an example of that, of the novel and the film? Or not? Yeah, no, it was, it was mostly the novel that I was reading uh, a few years ago, and there was just something about the kind of uh, exotic location in my mind of, uh, of, of Mexico and just this, these images I was really, I was really attracted to, you know, and I, I just kind of wanted to write this epic, you know, ballad, <laughs> of, uh, but, but at the same time telling a story that was kind of familiar at the same time of like uh, this alcoholic destruction of a guy. Yeah. That's interesting. But uh, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song. I mean, there's a, again, you have you have a lot of, but you also have a lot of humor in your in your work, and and, and comedy and things. Um, did you want to talk about some of the humor or sort of the satire, satirical, like a, the yeah, song, you know, no, what were you said oh, about the, the the junkyard, my soul on the heap. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, 
I remember when I wrote that song, I, I listened to this uh, radio show my friend John Funky does every Saturday called Backwoods on okay. WNBR. And he plays these songs from the 50s, a lot of like rockabilly, old country. I remember uh, biking to, to work at the record store like uh, mm -hmm. three years ago after listening to that show. And, you know, these old 50s country songs, they sing about topics that you don't hear people write about today. It's these kind of funny yeah. uh, subjects. Uh, and at the same time, I really feel strongly about uh, that theme of, you know, people chucking stuff away. Yeah. And what happens to it, this planned obsolescence of objects, and then kind of turning that into, you know, the uh, the, the uh, love theme, too, at the end of that. So yeah. I'm sorry, I'm still a little distracted here. I'm over at Dan Sunshine's house right now. Hey, and Tyler, is Dan Sunshine going to make an appearance? Are we going to say hi? He might make one in a few seconds. <laughs> Dan, come here. What's up, Mitch? Dan, you know Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like all the time. We had sunshine. Special guest appearance. Um podcast. Man, welcome to a journey of an esteem. Nice pleasure. I, I, pleasure. I, I, uh, you never really get two two guests. How have you been, Dan? How's your how's your how's your girlfriend, partner? How's your job? She's good. She's hanging in. She's uh a little bit tied up right now with some car issues, but um she's good. Everybody, have you she's noticed everybody has car trouble now? Everybody. <laughs> Am, I right? Am I right? What's going on with that? It's, it's the new COVID I right hear. It's going to be the next pandemic. It's <laughs> people's cars. So well, Dan's you know, kind of, yeah. Mitch, uh, Dan's a good guy to ask about the album too, because uh, I was hanging out with him a lot during the pandemic, yeah. playing okay. a lot of these songs. He was my you know, original audience for a lot oh, of these songs that. that appear on the album. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Great, great recordings of him just in the, you know, in an empty room playing the songs, you know, great pictures. It's a, it was like a cool, oh, wow. you know, cool way to capture that time. Definitely. You know, not many people got to experience that. So it was, that was, that was a nice thing for me because I was living alone. So Tyler was the only thing I had to connect me. So it was, that was a really nice and special thing for me to share. With. This really brings back a lot of memories. Remember that party we had? What was, what year oh, was God. that? I remember that party. Oh yeah, there was a, <laughs> there was a stew on the oven. I think he was. Yeah, so much fun. Yeah. Was Gia there too? And there was like I'm, somebody. I'm sure she Gia had to be there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like the episode would be had Gia Green, you Tyler, Gia's mom, who I love. I see her all the time walking around Harvard Square. You. Oh, Can she's, you know, she's you like know? one of those characters, you know, one of those people you know. Once yeah. you, once you, you know, know you, you see her. Can you tell her hi for me? Yeah, I will. I will next time I see her. I just um. I sort of so is this album in part a reaction to those two? Right, back, Mitch. Oh, I'm sit down again here. I, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go catch up with my roommate. He just got back with some beer. But Mitch, it was a pleasure. Absolutely, always. If you have any questions, any, any you have any other oh. questions, you let me know. I have questions. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll come he back. He's, back. Back. he's an authority here. You got a uh, you got an uh, authority uh, figure right here. <laughs> So do I ask the person who first listened to the album? Or I ask the person who made the album, right? So well, uh, you know, yeah. I don't. I I just write the songs, Mitch. You know, I don't. I don't claim to, to know what they're about. There's a. Um, it's really common, as you may or may not know, in academic art criticism, to use Barry Mallow. Speaking of, I write the songs mm -hmm. in a really negative way, like in. I just I noticed this. Yeah. If you notice that, like, what, uh, I had Robert Pippin on, on my show. He's a really, I love Robert Pippin. But Robert Pippin, Pippin, in his latest book on art, has a snide remark about Barry Manilow in one of the footnotes. And, and um, yeah, I know. And then yeah, they, they just hate him because they ain't him. You know, they, it's, uh, that, that's, that's success and riles. Well, 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 here's the thing about Barry Manilow, and I would not get into it with Robert Pippin. Barry Manilow, well, first of all, he's a great songwriter, as you know. Second of all, he was Bette Miller's musical director. Okay. In the early 70s, can you imagine? So <laughs> I actually don't even know what I'm saying is that- Why are you bringing up Manilow? Do you, do, do, do you hear uh, connections between my work and- Because I write the songs, and I thought the song, I write the songs, yeah. which is one of the big hits. <laughs> well, I know. Like, right. Well, well, Manilow and I have several key differences there, but uh, one of which <laughs> being notably that, you know, <laughs> I performed the songs on the acoustic guitar, you know, and right, right. got the Copacabana band behind him there. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's maybe uh, maybe it's a little little bunchy, but I wanted to ask about particular songs. So the first song I I was right that it was a Tom Petty feeling in it. 
Well, for, for, for that song, uh, Runaway, I think you're talking about is, it's kind of, I almost kind of heard it like a seventies radio hit when I was, when I was writing it. But I think those lyrics for some reason or other, uh, at the time I was really getting into the writer Eve Babbitt's. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think the opening line of Runaway is, uh, 10 little rooms at the Chateau. I, I was kind of thinking of, you know, the Chateau Marmont back mm -hmm. in the seventies or something reading about Babbitt's and, and she passed away. Uh, like a, a few months ago, her and Joan Didion, you know, the California contemporaries went. Absolutely. Well, e. Babbitts and Joan Didion have a deep spiritual connection, of course, uh, and also a connection to the. And social connection as well. Also, also a connection to the spirit of California, too. Yeah. And I am looking, I'm sure you know, I'm looking for a first edition of Babbitt's book. Oh, me too. They're hard to find. Yeah. So you, you're both looking for the same, looking the same book. You're gonna have to pay some good money for those bad. Probably, probably for it. Is it like a thousand dollars or something? I don't know. Some of these rare books are insanely expensive. Yeah, my my uh, my friend Stacy, you know, she she and I like going to these old bookstores, and it's just fascinating to look at, you know, what's rare these days. Yeah. Because now, like the 1990s, it's like an antique or something, you know. Yeah, it's like I'm sure you pay a lot of money for like a David Foster Wallace uh, Infinite Jest first edition or something. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, the, going back to the Runaway song, it's a 70s kind of radio hit, as the way I heard it in my mind. That and an homage to Eve Babbitt's too, kind of. That's it. I didn't know that that, that was that. I, I, well, that I don't think like like in life, you know, intentionality for a song. Well, almost, you know, it's almost doesn't matter. It gets overwhelmed by what the, the song ends up becoming, you know, when you're yeah. kind of finished. And uh, I just have been, as I've told you in the past, really enjoying playing with the band lately, man, because every time we do a show live, you know, I think the songs should should take on a different life, mm. you know, a different breath. And, and you know, the band, they, they listen to a lot of jazz records and stuff, and they yeah. play Monk and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So. You got to keep them interested. Keep them. Uh, keep the sharp. It reminds me of a uh, disco duck, which has a lawn instrumental vamp in the opening, right? Before you even talk about the evolution of that that song. Well, has. that song's interesting because Tim, our drummer, will tell you that the song never sounded better than when we first started uh, improvising it one rehearsal. Okay. Where I just kind of came up with a uh, that um, that really simple line: do do do, do do do. Right. And, for some reason, I started singing about the, the disco duck kind of came into mind. And every every performance, I would kind of take the song in a new narrative direction. And there's a line in the beginning of the song uh, about him, I think, talking to a football fan. Yeah. You know, and that kind of that, that line kind of came from when we were playing in these rowdy bars. And you're kind of looking at the audience. You're like, that guy sitting at the bar there. Looks like he enjoys a game of football or something. Patriots, you know? Patriots fan, Pats fan. Patriots fan. So Tom Brady. He's yeah. crying over the loss of Tom Brady, right? Or, or something. Yeah. And as you know, I'm not the biggest uh, fan of football. Right. Uh, so maybe there's a little antagonism in that song there, a little kind of violent, violent touch. But Tyler, like me, you're a fan of Friday Night Lights, the series, right? I hope. You know, I've been meaning to watch that show. I love uh, that writer who wrote the book. You got to watch it. Yeah. I mean, if you like, like I like semi tough and North Dallas 40. And... Well, I, I, you know, we're not going to get into it on the show here, but oh, we might. You, never know. You, you got me into that righteous gemstones show, man. That's out right now. And that show changed my life. I've, I just, I've been watching it the last few days. Everybody out there. If you're not watching the righteous gemstones, <laughs> that's it. Right. You're, I mean, it's just a great ensemble. Fan. Everyone on the show is fantastic. Everybody's amazing. John Goodman. And, oh, I was just thinking uh, today, actually, what an amazing career John Goodman has had playing these larger than life characters. Yeah. I mean, just think about these people he's portrayed the, the guy from A Brother Where Art Thou who comes up that hill, you know, and, and beats him down. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Walter from the Big Lebowski. I mean, the Coen brothers just love writing these great yeah, roles yeah. To, to utilize him. But yeah, I love that show. I think it's a show is really profound. Like, I'll say one thing about it. I think it actually gets right 
what's wrong with contemporary American Protestantism. Yeah. And the awfulness. I mean, again, I hate this is a very supposed to be a nonpartisan show, but yeah, that show nails the pathology yeah. of it all does. that stuff. But you know, there, 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 there's one song yeah. on the album that's kind of like uh, I'm trying to get in the head of this almost Southern Gothic kind of yeah. character on a, um, a clapboard place. Mm. And you know, I watched all these movies, and one morning I just had that Russ Meyer film Mud Honey on the TV. And there was something about that film that just kind of made me write this song after I finished wow. it. Wow. Well, I would never thought that that was again with your songs. I don't know the 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 um the inspiration or things I would never expect. Like I never expect much. You know, I, I was listening to this to this. Uh, you remember that show uh, Storytellers on uh, from the nineteen nineties? Huh. Where they had all these big names and like music come up and just kind of do stripped down acoustic acts. There's a great one with Tom Waits. Oh, and, wow. and, and in that episode, he says, you know, some songs, they come out of the ground like potatoes. Wow. You know. Do you have your guitar? Are you going to do a song now? or do you I do, yeah. I, I, you know, I was wondering if I should do a song from the album or something uh, new that I've been working on. So what I was thinking is one of each, something totally new and something from the album. Yeah. Both. Do you, do, you, do you have any particular songs you like to hear from the album? I don't know why Message in the Bottle. Well, what's the cut before Message in the uh, Not Bottom of the Bottle. <laughs> message in the Bottle. Bottom in the Bottle. The cut before Maybe that is uh, Had to Let You Know. Yeah, Had to Let You Know would be great. Okay. I'll, what do you want to say about that song? I love that song. Uh, that's, that is another song which came to me as I was uh, on my way to work, actually, at the at the record store. I was, for some reason, whenever I'm riding my bike around town, it's a good way to come up uh, with song lyrics. I don't know why. All right. But, uh, All right. but the song is from the protagonist of a guy who, for some reason or another, ends up in jail. And he calls his, uh, his ex Bo or something. Oh, wow. And true, and I've been a pack of lies. I've been the green grass of home, and the smog up in an LA sky. And I've been sorry that I ever let you go. Yeah, you probably don't give a damn. But I had to let you know I've been a rowdy old pool hall In a quiet country church I went looking for the treasure of Sierra Madre Then I gave up the search Well, you're just like a candle, you see I want to watch you as you glow yeah, you probably don't give a damn, but I had to let you know. I'm going to get me a big billboard and put it up on the side of the highway. <laughs> Proclaiming your virtues and many charms. Maybe it'll send you back my way. Well, I was pretty lousy to you. But you could have been the best. I could have been the best. Once we were full loose and fancy free, but now I'm under arrest. Well, the warden on cell block nine, he runs a pretty crazy show. Yeah, you probably don't give a damn. Yeah, you probably don't give a damn, but I had to let you know.
That's fantastic. Thank you, Mitch. That's fantastic. I mean, that actually, so your influences, so that's Randy Newman. That song is, <laughs> that's high praise, man. No, but am I right that unreliable, that protagonist? Oh, yeah, the unreliable narrator. Unreliable the narrator. narrator. But heavy. You'll have the heavy. I mean, not that he's the heavy, but, you know, he's like, who is this person? <laughs> Everybody's got to have their song. The bad guy's got to have a song, and the clueless have to have a song. Right? Yeah, you, you get into trouble nowadays, man, with the unreliable narrator, because the unreliable narrator could be saying things that decent people wouldn't say. Wrong. Yeah. But that's kind of what great art is, right? It's like, it's not about, I don't think good or great art is an instruction manual at all. No, no. And it's not a message from Western Union and all that. And it's not, you know, <laughs> or yeah. it's, not, it's not, it's like a, it's like a, um, it's basically, um, I call it a snapshot. It's like a snapshot of the soul. Mm -hmm. It could be the soul of America. Like when you talk about a billboard, that's so. I'm thinking about like people vanity billboards, right? That's what I, that's what I had in mind. <laughs> yes, like this is stuff like a like a sunset strip. Somebody <laughs> spends a lot of obscene amount of money. Like, but, but, <laughs> could you imagine though, if if, a, if an ex boyfriend <laughs> or something actually rented a billboard, you know, sure. in praise of this woman that he. Uh... That's very. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's America. That's the thing. Yeah. And that thing about America is like you can like hate that, right? You could, right? Well, I I, I think one thing that a lot well, of one could one could say that that's you know, you know we're we're a, we're a, we're a country of of show business people, right? Like you know if you're an American, you're you're in show business. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Sure. You know. Um. I like that though. I like. But, that. but uh, I, I'm happy with the arrangement on the record because. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a, a little a little darker uh, coloring on the album. You know, there's that kind of pedal steel that's ebbing in the background, and some great guitar work by uh, Bennett Keeley, who plays lead guitar. In the band. Yeah. And then and then you have Tim doing that that great drum part where it's barely noticeable. It's this uh, yeah, you know, almost sounds like a pair of bongos or something. Huh. Did you want to, uh, Stacey Thornton has a comment, Gladys Glover. What did she say? Gladys Glover. Gladys Glover. I don't know what that means. Ask her. Stacey, you got to talk about Gladys Glover. <laughs> Stacey, what are, you, what are you talking about, Gladys Glover? A great singer-songwriter. Oh, you know, okay. I don't know. I'm unfamiliar. But uh... What's a big school, so I need to learn about it. It is a big school, you know. Cool. And uh, oh, the Judy Holiday movie. Okay. <laughs> Look at that reaction to you know. Well, Mitch, Judy, I, 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 I like the, the backdrop on this wall you chose, by the way. All these framed pictures—they look—they look great. Yeah, it's Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, Melanie Mayron. Okay. This is uh, it's from Girlfriend. You know that film. I love that film. Look what I just picked up for the first time. Wow. Yeah. The Criteria yeah. Collection, About Time. Girlfriends. It came out in 2020. I'm just now getting it. About Time. It is About Time. Look at this. You gave me uh, Girlfriends on a VHS tape, actually. Who did? You did. Uh, and on VHS? You had a VHS copy of the of the film, and that's how I first saw it. Exercises. Look at that. That's great. Yeah, they, they do a phenomenal job, the Criterion people. So. Yeah, do you, yeah, you know, wow, look at that. Who 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 wrote the? Uh, Earl Gilligan. Wow. See, I, see, this is the thing. I'm gonna get overtly excited. But Mo reading Molly Haskell and Carol Gilligan. So I, th I think From Reverence to Rape by Molly Haskell. Yeah. Even when I don't agree with it, which is often, <laughs> yeah. she has this weird thesis. She like hates 
when she wrote this book, she was really down on 70s movies. Okay. As privileging, like people like the character in Five Easy Pieces, privileging, entitled, privileged male bad boys and behaviors, or sensitive, brooding Monty Clift, or I don't know, something. Yeah. Like that. And how only their stories are being told. Now that's a that's a that's a crude again. I'm not doing justice to her to her work, but it's a great work. But also, Carol Gilligan's in a different voice. Yeah, I'm wondering how people would respond to that book today, even though it was written in the '80s. I don't know. You know, well, I, 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 girlfriends. I, got, I got my mother to watch Girlfriends for the first time, oh. and uh, she really loved it. it. It was like something that I'm, I'm glad I, I could able I was able to. Uh, to turn her on to because she was a young woman growing up in that same time period of, of yeah. the movie takes place. See, my podcast is a kumbaya podcast. Yeah. My podcast is I want people, I want. Well, well I'm holding a guitar here. So. I'm holding a guitar. I, yeah, I want, like Carol Gilligan and, and Molly Haskell were in, I think in, are they're 70, right? I think, or in their 60s. So they're the same generation as the filmmakers of Girlfriends. Mm -hmm. But, Lena Dunham is a different gen. She's millennial, right? She's in her 40s, 30s. And so I like the idea of everybody coming together, right? And my show, everybody comes together in through their differences or their different experiences and comes to the campfire, comes to this screen and talks about their life or their experience. And I think out of that, something important comes. That's yeah. my idea of the show. That's a very, you know, I don't know what you think about that, but like on, you well, know. Well, you know, you've always liked to have these kind of roundtable conversations. I remember when we first met at Pete's, just the most bizarre people would just wander into the conversations and people you would, or, wouldn't ordinarily think would have an opinion about some of these things we'd be discussing. Oh, yeah. And we met guys who worked for the CIA, like Carl. Oh, yeah. Who gave his like bizarre opinions about <laughs> like, current affairs. Anyway. Where do you think he is now, given Ukraine? And Not only knows, he's probably like undercover in Ukraine somewhere. Probably, yeah. Godforsaken probably. war zone, you know. My God, Carl. But you know, well, these, are, these are people who I want to make into unreliable narrators. Well, you know, yeah. Have you written a song where Carl's a narrator about how? Idea. It could be like a Warren Zevon song about like, uh, you know, lawyers and yeah, lawyers and, and Carl. Did you want to do a song together, or is that too? Um, oh, I would love to do a song together. Yeah. Well, I don't know the material. I don't know if you're going to do a new song, or you're going to do a. Um... Well, you know, I was thinking. I kind of want to play the most recent thing I've written, which was okay. a song I literally just wrote yesterday. Okay. And it's going to be. And since you haven't heard it, it's better to do that than something that I know well. What key is it in? It's in a E major. Okay. E major, and, it, and it's a good song to do. Because it only has, uh, it doesn't have any chord changes either, so. Well, it's, the song's got to have chord changes. No? Well, it's that's a, not a chord change. You just played a chord it change. It is a chord change, but it's still uh, an exercise in minimalism there. All right. I'll just play. I just won't get in the way. I'll just kind of. No, no. It's, it's great to see your piano set up there, too, because I haven't been to your house in North Carolina. Wow. Right, let's start it. You start. The uh, I think I don't, I'm not sure what the title of this one is so far, but I think it might be called uh, long title. If you think you know about love and devotion, you haven't seen anything yet. Well, that's a. Foregone conclusion, baby, you're a natural fact. The sound of the on the water, the sound of a lightning crack. I knew that I wanted you from the first time we met. You know about love and devotion. You 
haven't seen anything yet, no, baby. A cold glass of champagne, your long distance call. You're that trip out to California, baby, you're everything at all. I get all crazy when I'm with you. My mouth gets watery and wet. If you think you know about love and devotion, baby, you haven't seen anything yet. No, no. You haven't seen anything yet. Outside your house, you see, spouting all the old cliches, wondering if I can come inside. You know, maybe the reason they're cliches is because they're true. <laughs> and it's plain, now, baby, plain as a killing in cold blood. Everyone wants a real fast car. They don't care what's under the hood. And I've got a lot of things eating away at me, but I don't have any regrets. And if you think you know about love and devotion, baby, you haven't seen anything yet. Good God, you haven't seen nothing yet. Great to hear you playing this. Well, it's, um, that's um. See, when you start start off with something like that, um. See, they had changes to it. You said there weren't changes. Yeah, right? I, I lied. There were some changes. Well, they're minimal. They're kind of, but it's like um. So is this a song about um? Wow, is this a song about? Well, it's similar to the other song, right? It's like, well, these are the cliches. Yeah. Um, but to, to me, that this is a far more upbeat number than had to let you know where right. the, 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 the protagonist kind of realizes that, uh, you know, this, this kind of opportunity at great love is yeah. right in front of him or her and right. you know, follow it down. Wow. And try and honor it. But sure. yeah, I, it's just kind of something... I've been working on the last few days and I, I've been, I've been, I've been digging it, you know, I've, I've been enjoying playing it. So I, I like what you were doing there too. You know, I might have to fly you down, Mitch. Well, back in you know, on the same session. Um, well, I don't, I don't know. I sort of feel like, um, you know, the thing about music uh, to me is um, like, I, I have a role on piano with the, your song. Like in this, what we just did here, my job is to follow your, my job is to serve your song. Yeah. That's my only job. 
Now, it's possible I may go in a different direction if I have a solo space or if you stop. But, like, until that point, it's about trying to hear yeah. where I fit into your song. Yeah. I'm not interested in any other criteria. Like, I, I'm happy. Like, if I can serve your song and support the song, I feel well, I'm well, well, that, that's one of the great things about playing with a band that uh, does kind of improvisations is that, you know, even if it's your song, you know, it, it's like uh, it's everyone's responsible for it right? on, on the stage there. And, and that I, I think is the reason people respond to music so much is because you're watching something taking place. That's sure. about camaraderie. That's about, you know, you, like if, if someone's not pulling their weight, the song suffers. So. Yeah. You have to feel it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, sometimes I feel like, you know, music is honest, music is, is fair, and, you know, the world ain't that, which is, I think, why people still chase it down is because there's hmm. something about it you can't fake. You can try to, but it's going to come off like a bad smell in the room or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, is that your feeling about what music is, is that it has to be, um, it has to um, express something of you in it? Something of what? Of you in it. You, whoever. Yeah, I mean, a, a view could, could 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 be nothing, right? It could just be someone sitting around doing nothing. But it's like John Cage would tell you, there's always something and nothing there, hmm. which true. I believe. You know, I met him. Where, where did you meet John Cage? He taught at NEC. Oh yeah, he had uh, you had that famous story where the woman, uh, the woman, woman wanted to labor while moved to one of his pieces. Isn't that fantastic? You're John Cage and music is about everything is music. And this woman goes into labor and like Cage is like it's almost out of like a it's almost too good to be true that that, (laughs) yeah. Apocryphal. Um yeah, I mean that's um but uh but uh did uh did uh, you like that new song man? I loved it, yeah, I loved it. I really felt it. It's 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 also kind of when I wrote I I thought to myself, this is like uh I don't write many songs that I think could be like soul songs or something. I mean, they hopefully they oh, have yeah. some soul in them, but yeah. that one I could kind of imagine a you know a real great soul singer doing. Yeah, real situation. That's true. Maybe, it's me. Maybe I gotta. You know. well, I like to play that way. I mean, that's one of the things that I really enjoy doing. So I may get kind of get into that, even if it wasn't the original intention. Yeah, you know, every every uh, player works differently, man. Like on the last album, I had that uh, piano player Harvey Diamond, the great Harvey Diamond play. And I remember showing him the songs and with, with Harvey, it was a kind of slower process of, of learning the material and finding out what he wanted to contribute to it. Yeah. But um, I feel like with you, you know, there's always, there's always a, a quick, quick uh, ideas that come, come to the fore, you know, where, where it's it's almost like uh, for 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 the songs there could be too much happening, you know. That sometimes you gotta uh, have a, a less is more. I try to stay out of the way. Yeah, I hope I hope I succeed. No, you you you, yeah. you do. It's like it's better to have I think a lot of ideas that you know you could you could scrap for other ones. You know, it's always good to have things on the table. Well, you know, I've been listening to a lot of different kinds of music, so I don't know. Like I watched the Gun Campbell documentary. Did you see that? Oh, I haven't seen it, but. You haven't seen it. It's very heavy, right? It's like uh, well, let me show you something. Oh, do you know this book? I, I've, I've I've read that book. Yeah, well, you've read it. Yeah. So, what were your impressions of this book? Um, it's very much a snapshot of that era, right? Of where the you know these these uh, women were trying to fit into this uh, industry, which in which there were very few prominent female singer songwriters, you know? Right. And I think most notably for me, Carol King and Joni Mitchell are two, you know, fantastic songwriters. I, 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 I do like Carly Simon, but to, for, for me, I, I can't, I can't put them in the same category or put her in the same category as Mitchell and, uh, and King. You know? Right. Well, they're very different, of course. I mean, they're I mean, I mean uh, you know, and I think that that comes down to my, uh, you know, I, I I do love pop, and to me, I consider Carly Simon more of a pop 
artist than than Joni Mitchell, you know. Uh, sure. Well, that's a, that's a that might be an important difference for you. I mean, it depends on you know. So, see, I'm I've got that, but I also have what else do I have? I have I have this original first edition Burt Backrack. Oh now, man, yeah, look at that. Yeah, so clearly I'm interested. Am I interested in that era? Clearly, clearly, yeah. I mean, it's just you know, like, about a month ago, Stacy and I were listening to a bunch of Burt Bacharach, and there's just there's it's endless the the great yeah. songs he came up with there. A great arranger yeah. too, Bacharach. Oh yeah, but I mean, I study this stuff. Like I study it. See, I'm, I'm I study I study that stuff, and I also study. Um, Bartok's fourth quartet. Wow. See the coffee rains. I'm studying. Yep. So I'm always so I, my mind is like, not literally, like literally, how do you combine Burt Backrack and Bartok? But sort of, I mean, in a way, that's my project. Sort of in a weird sort yeah. of Johnny Mitchell. Yeah. It's all goes into the into the into Well, the, you know, they're, they're they're all linked by the you know the sound being communicated there, where you know, I mean you you can you can roll around the world with, with your hierarchy and everyone has their personal hierarchy of, of yeah. stuff that means more than the others but yeah you shut yourself off to a lot too if you if you go around that mentality mm -hmm. so. remember that experience we had watching the robin williams picture yes that person i'm not going to mention their name and they were um, was it goodwill hunting it was it was it was recently after williams had 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 died and it was almost like a wake it was like a wake it was awake, and after the movie, we went up to this mutual acquaintance of ours, and she says, uh, "I never really cared for the for the work, you know." He did. I said, "Well, oh, yeah. you know, it's interesting. You're in a room full of people who are basically grieving Robin Williams, the guy. It's like going to a funeral and say, ah, didn't care too much for the <laughs> deceased, you know." It's always easy to criticize, isn't it? It is. Well, you know, it's like I like. Well, I like to see this woman go to the the heights that Williams did during his Met oh, special. You know? So, yeah. So that's my response to a lot of critics. Well, I'm like, why don't you write your own damn novel? Why don't you, you know, uh, do it? But but at the same time, I read tons of, of criticism, and I and I and I I think artists should, you know. But yeah. uh, because when when you when you're getting you know someone like Molly Haskell or a Pauline Kale, oh yeah, the, the way that someone else views a film could be completely different than you or I. And uh, I, I like the, 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 the disparity of those viewpoints there. You know? Yeah. I mean, I sort of feel like I just mentioned that Molly Haskell because she wrote for the program notes for this. Um, oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it makes me, it actually makes me want to go back and reread from reverence to Ray, which I we're, did. We're in a, we're in a, her and Andrew. Uh, Andrew Sarah, so, yeah. 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 Like but what I'm saying is that like like uh, Robin Williams, like those HBO specials where he's talking about doing drugs and doing coke and like um, in like 79 or 80 and doing, you know, impersonations of Soviet dissidents and Russian dissidents and hairdressers. I mean, I'm thinking his, right? It's amazing, yeah. It's amazing. It's genius. It is. Is genius what Robin Williams did, and like the thing of it is, it's I've been thinking about of like he did all that material, and then he started doing a sitcom, Mork and Mindy. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen any other performer, let alone comedian, come any person ever come as close to mimicking like hard bebop from the forties, like Robin Williams when he was going well, on those, those. Yeah, it's like it is like he's so. Yeah, it's it was like just a, endless, you know. Yeah, get one connection to lead it to another. Absolutely, absolutely, and so I sort of feel like when he plays like a shrink in Goodwill Hunting in Cambridge, the Gus Van Sant film. I sort of feel like it's. I feel like it's all the same thing. It is. Well, I you know the same. I'm, I'm of the school where it's all one thing. You know, I, I'm almost yeah. like a Hegelian in that matter. To me, it's yeah. all just one 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 big arena where. Mm -hmm. Some some performance an actor does in a movie can can be like a song, you know, a soliloquy or a monologue or something. And, yeah. You know, I, I think if you talk to actors, a lot of the time they'll they'll be listening to you know music in their trailer or something, trying to get in a certain headspace where, 
you know, what, what is Randy Newman in those songs, if not an actor, you know, playing a character, you know, some of his, what do you think of some of his characters? Like uh drop the big one or well, maybe I'm doing it wrong. And how about, uh, on one of his Batman. Records, have you ever heard that song Korean parents where he kind of talks about, how we should all kind of emulate, uh, the the tenacity and diligence of these Korean students or something. Right. <laughs> it's like who would write a song like that? It's just it's 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 great. Well it is great because you know right when he wrote that song probably somebody wrote an essay. Yeah. Probably yeah. no wait in Harper's about how Americans should be ashamed of themselves because they're not hard working, right? Yeah. Right, which is sort of another form of, of kind of weird racism or something. It's like a weird, right? It's like some yeah, it's like um. Well, well, uh, that's Reaganism, right there. That the you know the poor, if they're not if they're not achieving this, it's their own damn fault. There, these welfare queens. It's the reverse, right? It's like we're gonna worship you because you achieved all this, or we're gonna we're gonna say, why aren't you doing your part? It's you all know, the same. It's, it's all because <laughs> and during our conversations, we always bring up for some reason, uh, you know, seventies, eighties, and nineties. Yeah, and, and I would love to see a symposium on your show just on the '80s there, about you know, cultural figures from the '80s who were working during that period, just talking sure. about their general recollections of what that decade meant to them. There, you know? Well, the whole the whole Warhol series is '80s, right? Because yeah. Basquiat, you know, and NTV, and he's incredible too, Basquiat. Man, that guy is. Oh funny. my god! Yeah. I mean. I don't think we know. I don't think we know what something is. It's done, right? Yeah, like, something like that. People do things, and then we sort of feel. Isn't it interesting to sort of relate to something long after? Oh yeah, well, like thirty years. I, later. I was just saying the other day. You know, that's that's why art is so appealing to me. There is because you're given the reflection that's often denied to you as things are happening in real time. You know, it's like this yeah. great depository where people can make sense of things in a way that's actually clearer than how reality plays out, you know. Oftentimes, I think in art, we, we get a clarity that we're not granted in, in real life. You know? In daily life, yeah. Daily life. Or, or, or we get the opposite, a, a confusion or chaos or anarchy. Yeah, clarity. Yeah. Yeah, something's muddied for you when you thought you understood it. And then you, it's actually the opposite of clarity. Well, you once said something to me that I always think about where it's, I think you were talking about at the time your, your preference for kind of formalism in music, but yeah. chaos in cinema or, or kind of things that are more avant-garde in, in that medium. I was trying to understand why I like, yeah, why is my taste in music so conservative, right? Yeah. Like tonality. And why is my taste in film so radical? Like, why do I like non- Why do you think that is? I still have, don't know why. I, don't know. I think it has to do with the ears or something. Why don't, yeah. 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 Well, why do I love Marie Mason? Like everyone has their own yeah. version, of, version of what sounds right to them, right? It's like, yeah, what well, looks right. It's I like, mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's, uh, Sly, Sly Stone recorded the vocals for There's a Riot Going On in bed. In his in his bed. He wouldn't get to him. That's, that's just the sound he wanted to get. For yeah. that time, that is not the sound the sound Frank Sinatra probably wanted to, to get, you know, going to the studio there. Hmm. But, yeah. you know, what sounded right to him would sound terrible to Sinatra, you know. Well, I have to think about that. That's, yeah, what Sinatra. But Sinatra had a very specific thing he would, you know, he would try and go for in the studio. and Sure. Um, you know what uh, Stacy and I were listening to a few weeks ago in New York was a song that uh, when I had lunch with my uncle, who getting back to the album for a second here, did what I think to be a fantastic cover. It is a fan album. I mean, do you have a copy of the poster there, or do you have? Can you show it to the? I don't have a physical copy handy, but uh, this you know, cover I, oh. of your album. What do you it? want to talk about like what that? I mean, is it's like R. Crumb came and did your cover. Or something that, that was the goal, yeah. To get a kind of uh, remember that comic zap comics that would have like, these yeah, comics, yeah, cover, yeah. Uh, but uh, my uncle, I'd always known he, I, he had done these great cartoons 
Yeah. Uh, and I've kind of gone to school for it back in the early 80s. He actually had Will Eisner as his instructor, Harvey Kurtzman from MAD. And oh, wow. he, he had met Crum back when he had come to lecture there. But he's just a – he has a great style. And it was actually a good way to kind of uh, get a little closer bond with him during the process of kind of telling him that I wanted to Groucho Marx in the moon and mm. Italy standing in the middle of the – the circus, yeah. the album cover there. Mm -hmm. But to me, I also wanted to get the band on the cover, yeah. uh, albeit in cartoon form, uh, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it has a lot of problems, the, the, the music community in Boston here, but ultimately it's something that I've gotten a lot out of, of just kind of going out to see music being played around town here every night, especially you know, missing it during the pandemic. Uh, yeah. But the, the front of that album cover is a reference to the song Obies, which is the second song off the record. And also just, you know, the experience of being in the middle of uh, Alston, of being in the, the hubbub of whatever that is there, you know. Yeah. What are your feelings about that? It's kind of just... Um... Well, the, the song O'Brien's, it's about this club that I think you and I played at back yeah. in the day there, where just this kind of you know, hole in the wall, kind of rowdy club, but you, you get all kinds of people coming in there and they have live music every night. And I just kind of wanted to write a song as an homage to this kind of, you know, modern day honky tonk environment of O'Brien's. Yeah. And uh, two of the references that I made in that song of the Regina's pizza across the street yeah. and uh, some gas station that I you know, mentioned yeah. in the song, they're, they're, they're both gone now. So it's interesting how you write something and then, you know, the world in which you wrote about is uh, no longer there. They are? No yeah. longer there, yeah. I mean, you know, those two places don't exist anymore. So okay. What the fuck is there? A parking lot or what? Or just a parking lot. Not, 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 not anything you would take tourists to see, probably, if you were giving them a tour of Boston, you know. No, it's not a scenic area, particularly. But also important. Like, like, look at this. That's why I bought all these Think Coffee mugs. Think Coffee. In New York because I figured, you know, <laughs> I actually want Think Coffee to go on, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want them to disappear. I like that place. Oh, yeah. It's like, that's like Regina's Pizza. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right? if, I was in, if I was living in New York City still where I grew up, I, I'd be writing about uh, New York locations maybe and – you know, I like to I like I like to throw in references to things that happen to me, places I've, I've been living and stuff in the songs. Yeah. Because you know, it's good. It's good because uh, there, there's a guy, uh, this great guy Charlie, who's been coming to the shows, and uh, a, a person who uh, I'm really happy to have on board. You play these shows and you and you kind of meet new fans and new people who kind of really dig what you're doing. And he, and he said that. You know, when you reference these Austin locations in your yeah. songs, it's nice to hear that in the songs. In a song, because people's ordinary lives, the places they go, often aren't, you know, heard about. And that's the quotidian. Yeah, quotidian. I'm always talking about. I think to me, the quotidian is everything. I agree with you. Like, on that. It's like this uh, Tom Wolf essay. Tom essay, it's the interview, right, where he's talking about the Beatles. And Tom Wolf feels that regionalism is important. And like, well, what, what's an example? Of regionalism and Tom West says Liverpool. Like when the Beatles became famous, everybody was talking about Liverpool. Yep. <laughs> Just this town, this place in Britain. I, I was reading this, I was reading this John Lennon quote recently where he says, I'm just a guy from the sticks who took over the world. Yeah. Because the world is the sticks. It There's is. no difference, right? Yeah. The region is the world, right? Liverpool is the same as Austin, is the same as... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you went to some, to some bar in Haiti, you yeah. probably get some ver same similar version of the conversation yeah. that you get in Boston there. Sure. I don't like my job, you know. Yeah, the same like time. Me, you know, right. Stuff. Well, their, car, their car broke down and they need to find a, you know, it does, I need to find a good muffler or something. I don't know. Or what. <laughs> well, it, it, it's great to, to see you, Mitch, on the, on the videos yeah. over there. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy uh, to do this. And you come, is there anything you want to talk about the band or music or movies you've seen that have impressed you? Or I don't uh, know. There's a lot going on, right? 
There's always a lot of lots of righteous gemstones. Oh man. Men. Well, you know, whatever I'm, I'm I'm reading or watching at the moment, I like to bug other people about it. and I keep telling everyone I know to watch this gemstones show. And uh I mean, there's a character on this show called Baby Billy <laughs> who has like <laughs> huge teeth and this <laughs> pompadour of white hair and three piece suits. <laughs> This character seems like 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 an homage to these like I don't know, I don't know. kind of people you see like in yeah I mean it's just movie. yeah I just don't know yeah he's like um, I mean Danny McBride's character has these big sideburns that he keeps the entire show yeah it's fantastic <laughs> I mean how much how much of that you think is sort of southern kind of southern is it like um. Is it like uh, Eastbound and Down? A little oh, bit? yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a better show in some ways, though, than Eastbound. Yeah. And I, and I like that show, but, yeah. um, you know. You, ha you haven't seen Vice Principals, have you? No, I have not. Do you recommend that? Of course, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, um, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, stuff I'm uh, listening to, you know, I, I got a bunch of uh, free CDs recently, uh, free oh. albums, and uh, in that in that collection was a, a Bjork CD from 1995, I think called Post, and it's just yeah. something that uh, you know I don't I don't make music particularly that sounds like Bjork, but oh. there's something about her voice, and sure. uh, she's just a terrific singer, man. You know. Oh, she's amazing. And 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 talk about arranging, you know. Yeah, she's. And, and and things that might not sound good or make sense to another arranger, they make sense to Bjork, and she has her own kind of uh, her own world of sounds that she likes to employ there. Are you a fan of jo Joanna Newsom? You know, I'm a huge fan of hers. We man. never discussed. I don't know. Yeah, we have discussed this because. Oh. You know, you told me that your friend Dama. Yeah. Who who has been on the uh, your show before? Yeah. Artist, you and her used to listen to that. Have one on me record every day, right? It was yeah, we, it was religious, and she had like a box set. Well, that's the whole thing about the album, right? The power of the album. I know, I know. You know, I, I mean that that record. That's to, me, that's to me is one of the towering achievements of of this century so far. Is that in terms of music? Is that that record? Yeah, it's just who else is writing songs like that? Nobody. No, but well, she is. Yeah, I know. It's you know, it's almost comes out of another world or something. She's playing this harp and yeah, singing these songs that are just so expansive and fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But I actually saw her with uh, Dan Sunshine in New York about three oh. years ago at this beautiful old theater, and uh, she sounded great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and and someone and talk about kismet or kind of these connections that are being made uh, before the show, I was talking with Dan and a friend of mine about John Cale, about how much we love John Cale from the underground and his solo records. And, and that night, someone from the audience shouted out to Joanna Newsom, what are you listening to? And she said, John Cale, you know, there you go. Strange. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Isn't that like one of the best movies of the year? Todd Haynes movie. Oh man. Fantastic. With the split screen and what he does with the yeah, Stacy and I saw it in the theater and uh, it sounded amazing. Yeah, just like that that opening where that drone comes on. Yeah, and then, and then suddenly you're taken to a completely different era of that talk show, where John Cale's on like the one of these <laughs> these talk shows you don't see anymore. Yeah, but also just like what a what an ensemble of musicians there. These people, one guy comes from Wales and studied with uh, these avant-garde composers. Another guy comes from Brooklyn. Yep. And, you know, is interested in doo-wop and stuff. And then yeah. you got this, this is drummer who's listening to Ola Tunji records. So it just, it's. Well, you know, the other thing too, is that that Frank Zappa Velvet Underground conflict. Do you know the story about Frank Zappa's audition with George Duke? No, I don't. George Duke comes in and, and he says, well, what do you want me to play? He puts in front of George Duke a doo-wop song. And sort of like, right? So it's all, you know. It's, you know. Yep. Right? 
There it is. And you said that was so white, isn't that right? Yep. So Frank Zappa loved doo wop. Well, 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 that's, that's something Lou Reed and Zappa had in common, man. Is this love of doo wop? Well, and they were both, you know, they're both kind of control freaks, I guess, too. Yeah. Later on in their careers. They're so both they're just kind of like you know these, these horses of the same color coming too close to one another or something. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's just they both like doo wop, so that's what matters to me. <laughs> yeah. That's all I care about is a doo wop. I don't care about this other stuff about which band was cooler. Or I'm interested in the sound of the doo wop music. And I've actually been, been getting. Uh, yeah. I've always I've always loved that music, but I'm not uh, actually not a fan of doo wop. But yeah. sort of hearing George Duke talk about it and how he hated it, he hated having to play that because he he had played with Cannonball Adderley. What is he? Of course, he's what do you? Yeah. I mean, after after doing a gig with Cannonball Adderley, he's like one of the greatest magicians ever. Yeah. On that level, and then having to play like doo wop piano parts for Frank Zappa, but that's what Zappa wanted. And he's like, Well, I saw the beauty in it, I learned to love the doo wop, and that's, wow, what, that's what he said. Huh? That's what my show's about. That's this podcast, learning to love the doo wop with Mitch Hamilton. Love the doo-wop. That's, <laughs> that's the point of that's yeah, I want the doo wop in with the Beth Levin and the Emperor yeah. Concerto and the and the yeah, and the, the Beethoven Sonata, yes. Yeah, well, All here. You, you you can never tell what, what's going to affect you and how it's going to affect you, you know? That's true. Uh, that's why I think, I don't believe there's such a thing as a guilty pleasure. To me, there's just pleasure. Yeah, it's just pleasure, yeah. I mean, maybe if you're if you're killing someone while you're you know listening yeah. to it, that's... You should, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess so, but it's like, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, that was the, the Jim Jarmusch interview, right? What does he say? He said, well, in the interview, is film comment. And Broken Flowers had just come out with Bill Murray and mm -hmm. great film, right? Tilda Swinton and Samantha. Who's in, who's in? It's amazing cast. Broken yeah, it's great cast. But what does he say in the interview? In the interview, he says he doesn't believe in guilty pleasures. He says, I like both Beethoven and the Battle of Surfers. And I want to live in a world in which I can hear Beethoven and the Battle of Surfers. Yeah. In the yeah. same, yeah, being able to listen to both. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Well, well, you know, the, the the band and me, the guys in the band, we all have very different tastes in, in music there, where, uh -huh. you know, there's just certain things, there's certain things we come together on. Like, I think we could probably all agree that we love Ornette Coleman or something, but yeah. there are other things which I don't like that uh, someone else may be obsessed with. But, like what? What's an example of that? Well, I don't want to start any uh, infighting here in the band by bringing this up, but you know, but uh, the organ player Sterling, who is a, an amazing character and a great guy, who uh, his first time appearing on Tyler the Names album, he you know likes stuff to be a uh, tight power pop, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. which I we come together on bands like Big Star and stuff, but. For instance, like he's obsessed with the cars, and you know, to me, it's like I'm not really obsessed with that band, you know, but I can appreciate his his uh his interest. You know who would agree with him is um Cameron Crow would agree with him. He probably would, yeah. And so would Link uh, Rick Linklater, and so would Chuck Lofton. Oh, Rick Linklater, yeah. They would yeah. all see the virtue of the cars and Big Star, <laughs> right? I, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is like that thing with the Eagles, right? And what thing with the Eagles? Well, what is Dan, ask Dan Sunshine? Does he does he disagree with Dan Sunshine? Went off in the other room. I don't know what he's doing there. Oh, but that thing in the Cohen Brothers, right? About um, how the Eagles are sort of the, you know. Oh yeah, when uh, the Lebowski is in the cab and the big Lebowski, and he said, "I just hate the Eagles, man," and the dude kicks him out of the taxi cab. That's right. So that's you know. But, uh, you know, I've, it's interesting how when, when someone will kind of play you a piece of music and, yeah. you're, and, they're, and they're trying to convey to you why they like it so much, to me, that's the best way to, to get me to, to see something from a different angle is when, sure. you know, is when you're uh, stepping into someone else's world. Right. That's a world, you yeah. know. It's like, it's like when someone takes you for a ride in your car or something and they have some CD on or, or a tape yeah. where – you know, it's just you're stepping into their world by. Yep, that's it. Yeah. And that's like a snapshot of what that is, whatever that is. It is. I well, don't have to like it. I don't well, have to love it. 
but I but I gotta tell you, if if somebody wants to be on my show that's into it, come on my show. Yeah, I'll put I'll put you on the show. That's it. I know. I know. That's it. I would have Big Star on here in a second. I don't particularly like. I don't know anything about Big Star. I'm not. Well, you know that, that uh, they they wrote the theme song to one of your favorite television shows, that '70s show. Yeah, I, I'm sort of fitting. Yeah, I do. hanging out down the street, the same old things we did last week. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I gotta, which, which, which in a way is a you know a prevailing theme for my band there because you yeah. know we're all of around a, a certain age demographic right and I I think it's a a good thing when when a band can you know spend some time together and socialize together but at the same time there are bands which are great which didn't want to do that at all you know so. Right. One of my favorite bands from the uh, punk scene, late seventies television. Apparently, they, they didn't spend any time together outside of the studio and on stage. But that's interesting. You know. But uh, Misha, I, I think I actually have to draw this interview to a close soon. Oh, it's been too long for you. Well, uh, I got to get a glass of water here, man. You know, okay. Parched, but well, that's important. It's been great having you here. I enjoyed. Uh, you're it's really been a pleasure. Thank you for having the album, me. The album for those who should buy it is called The Bullfrog's Lamentation. Tyler and the Names, The Bullfrog's Lamentation. And you can you can purchase it on bandcamp.com. And um, I think we'll do something in person someday, right? Like we did we here. We will. We will. In some form. We will rise again. We will we'll rise again. Thank yeah. you, Tyler. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you. Enjoy it.